We're going to continue to expose the harlot of the book of Revelation and show you that it's first century Jerusalem. No, it's not the Roman Catholic Church. It's not a future one world church. People fail to look and correspond to the rest of the Bible when they read Revelation 17 and seek to find out who the harlot of Revelation actually is. We showed you that Revelation 18 and 24 said that inside the harlot was the blood, all the blood shed on the earth and the blood of prophets. Jesus said in Matthew 23 that all the blood shed on the earth was going to be required at the head of Jerusalem. And Jesus also said it's not possible for a prophet to perish outside Jerusalem. And so he said in two points of Revelation 18 and 24, things that directly pointed to Jerusalem when Revelation talks about the harlot. And we showed you how all through Ezekiel chapter 16, he's called calling Jerusalem the harlot and a whorish, imperious woman over and over and over again. He talks about committing fornication. In Revelation 17, they committed the harlot committed fornication with the kings of the earth. Well, in Acts chapter 4, it interprets the kings of the earth, Rome, Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles getting together with Herod, Israel, and the Jews together in one group. And there's the fornication with the kings of the earth. And that was in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 4, when they were being persecuted by the Jews and by the Romans and, and had a prayer meeting after Peter and John healed the man at the gate. And over and over, we're seeing all through the Old Testament, Deuteronomy and Leviticus, four sets of sevenfold judgments, just like Revelation has the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven uh, thunders, and the seven vials. And it's written to those that are under the law when you're reading the law. These are curses that you see in Revelation that were written under the law to Israel, the only nation that was ever under the law. And historicism, you're wrong. <laughs> I say that with humility. Uh, futurism, you're wrong. You see, futurism and historicism have one common denominator of a problem. They're looking at what happened to them in their day, and then they think the whole Bible refers to that. Now, futurism restricts everything to our generation right now. It seems like the pattern of futurism is whatever generation you're in, whatever atrocities happening, whatever persecutions happening, Revelation's talking about that. And then 10 years later, something else happens. Revelation's talking about that. And, and it changes. It's so fluid. And historicists, the only consistency really there is, is they say it's just the Roman Catholic Church. And historicism came about when the Roman Catholic Church was persecuting a lot of believers that weren't Roman Catholic. And so they did the same mistake. What was going on in their day, that pointed to them. But here this view is consistently showing you it's first century Jerusalem and the early church. You see, Revelation is a changeover from covenants, from old to new. And it's just like the rest of the New Testament. It's talking like Paul did about how the Jews resisted the new covenant and how that there had to be a lot of teaching about coming into the new covenant, how the Gentiles are in there. Well, the people of Jerusalem cried out to Pilate, his blood, Jesus' blood, be on them and their children. And Jesus picked up on that even before they said it, when he was carrying his cross up to Mount Golgotha to be crucified and the women were weeping for him. And he said, don't weep for me. Weep for you and your children, because you folks are going to cry for the rocks and mountains to cover you. And that's exactly what the sixth seal of Revelation chapter 6 says. They cried for the rocks and the mountains to cover them. Like, there's so much in the Bible, especially the Old Testament and Ezekiel, that corresponds to what's written in Revelation that distinctly points to Jerusalem. These were women of Jerusalem weeping distinctly noted to be of Jerusalem. And Jesus said, the six seals happening to you folks virtually. Now we're going to Ezekiel 22 and 23 and show you even more how it is Jerusalem of the first century. In Ezekiel 22 and verse 1 and 2, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now thou son of man, wilt thou judge, and wilt thou judge the bloody city? Who is the bloody city? Yea, thou shalt show her all her abominations. And when you drop down to verse 15, And I will scatter thee among the heathen, disperse thee in the countries, and will consume thy filthiness out of thee, and thou shalt make thine inheritance in thyself 
in the sight of the heathen, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came unto me, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the mists of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you all are become dross, behold, therefore, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so I will gather you in mine anger and I will leave you and in my fury and I will leave you there and melt you. So he's clearly again talking about Jerusalem getting a lot of judgments. And this is what he did in AD 70. He gathered them and the people had actually come from all nations of the world and at that time, the then known world came for the feasts of Israel. And Josephus says that's why there were so many. 1.1 million Jews died in Jerusalem in the siege of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus had said before that generation to whom he was speaking would pass away, all the things, including the temple destruction in the first few verses of Matthew 24, would come to pass. They were the days of vengeance. And that's interesting because in Revelation and the fifth seal, there were souls under the altar asking and praying for vengeance. When shall you avenge our blood on those that dwell on the earth, those persecutors, the Jews and Jerusalem's unbelievers that fought the church, crucified Jesus, and so forth. So we're dealing with the change of covenants. And when you go to verses 21 and 22, Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst thereof, as silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so you shall be melted in the midst thereof, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. So he's talking about the fire of his wrath. And that's what you read about in Revelation chapter 6 and the sixth seal, when they say, again, fall, fall on us mountains and rocks, cover us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? You see, it, it boggles my mind. There's so much scripture. You compare Revelation with all these references, and it's Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the harlot, the harlot. Reve Ezekiel chapter 16 uh, uh, agrees with Revelation chapter 17. All this woman decked with jewels and precious stones, and, and Ezekiel said she would be made bare and naked before all her lovers, so to speak, and, and then they would burn her with fire. That's exactly what you read about in Revelation 17 about the harlot. And then when you go into Ezekiel chapter 23, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, it came again saying, Son of man, there are two women, the daughters of one mother. They committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breasts pressed and there they bruised the teats of their virginity. And the names of them were Ahola, the elder, and Aholaba, her sister. And they were mine, and they bare sons and daughters. Thus were their names. Samaria is Ahola. Jerusalem is Aholaba. And notice, God said they were mine. And in verse 5, Ahola played the harlot when she was mine. And she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors. See, the northern portion of Israel later became Samaria, went mixed with the Gentiles in Assyria, taken into captivity. So Samaria is Ahola, and Aholaba is Jerusalem. He names them out straight. And in verse 11 through to 15, And when her sister Aholaba saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate love than she. And in her whoredoms, more than her sister in her whoredoms, she doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors. Captains and rulers clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw that she was defiled, that they took both one way, and that she increased her whoredoms. For when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion, girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, all of them princes to look at, after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, 
the land of their nativity. And notice this, the Babylonians. Now, the Babylonian region was where uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, was taken captive, where previously the northern Israelite kingdom was taken into Assyria. And this is a lot of the reason that the harlots called Babylon the Great. There's a connection with Babylon and this system. And then when you go to verse 16, as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them, sent messengers unto them into Chaldea. And the Babylonians came into her in the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredom. See how Babylon is affecting Jerusalem and Judah with her whoredom. And she was polluted with them, and their mind was alienated from them. So the Babylonians came, and she's called Babylon the Great in Revelation. You see, none of these other views, the Roman Catholic Church and, and uh, m some one world church in the future, none of them have the foundation of sub and substance of why she's called Babylon the Great, like you're seeing Jerusalem. I mean, it's spelling it right out for us. Connections that these other views simply don't have because they're not derived from the rest of the Bible. They have to go to other books, historical books, to substantiate their claims. And historicism is all the centuries right up till now. But this view, you just stick with the Bible. You go to Deuteronomy, you go to Leviticus, Ezekiel, you go to Isaiah, Jeremiah. Isaiah talked about um, the faithful city became a harlot. And, and over and over again, you see the same truth if you stick with the Bible. So God said that when this harlot got into bed with all these people and committing whoredoms, he said, my mind was alienated from her. Look at verse 18. She, she discovered her whoredoms and discovered her nakedness. Then my mind was alienated from her like as my mind was alienated from her sister. Can you imagine a man seeing his wife go out and commit whoredoms like that? He just alienates himself from them. And down in verse 30 to 31, I will do these things unto thee because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen and because thou art polluted with their idols. Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister. Therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. You're seeing so many things now from the book of Revelation and it's talking about Jerusalem. She had a golden cup in her hand. It's the cup of wrath. And then in verse 32, Thus saith the Lord God, thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup, deep and large. Look at the emphasis upon drinking this cup. Thou shalt be laughed to scorn and had in derision. It containeth much. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness. There you go. Jerusalem, out in plain language, having a cup and getting drunk with it. And that's what you see in Revelation 17. And it's talking about her fornication with, with Babylon and so forth. There it is in Revelation 17 and 2. Drunk with the wine of her fornication, and he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Where did she get it? Ezekiel 16 says that was the jewelry God gave her. Having a golden cup in her hand. Just like Ezekiel 23 is telling us full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And it says, the blood of saints made this woman drunk and she was intoxicated and drunk. Exactly what you're seeing in Ezekiel 23. And sorrow, it says in chapter 23, verse 33, thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow with the cup of astonishment and desolation with the cup of thy sister Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it and suck it out and thou shalt break the sherds thereof, pluck off thine own breast, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. That is the cup of God's wrath, and she's drunk with the blood of the saints, because having shed the saints' blood, and having it upon her head, drinking it, that is meat for God's wrath to come against her. And then when you go down to verse 44, Yet they went in unto her, as they go in unto a woman that playeth the harlot. Who? Judah, Israel, Jerusalem, God's people. This is saying the exact same thing as Revelation. So went they in unto Ahola and unto Aholaba, the lewd women. God called these two women harlots. 
And in verses 45 to 47, And the righteous men, they shall judge them after the manner of adulteresses. See, playing the whore as an adulteress because she's married to God. And after the manner of women that shed blood because they are adulteresses and blood is in their hands. For thus saith the Lord, I will bring up a company upon them and I will give them to be removed and spoiled. That's the Romans. And the company shall stone them with stones, catapults, through rocks and boulders into the city when they finally destroyed it. Dispatch them with their swords. They shall slay their sons and their daughters and burn up their houses with fire. Did that already happen? Oh, yes, it happened. It happened exactly like you're reading it. In chapter 24 now, we also read this in verses 9 and 10. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city. I will even make the pile for fire great. And he already identified the a bloody city as Israel and Jerusalem. Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. Notice that it's finally going to be burned. And at the end of Revelation 17, Rome, the beast with its seven heads and ten horns, the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. There's no way you can get away from Jerusalem being the harlot if you stick to the Bible alone. Unlike futurism and historicism, and, and God bless those people, uh, I pray God shows them the truth, but they're not correct when it comes to what these prophecies and revelation are talking about. Now you just think about this. I'm proposing that the bulk of revelation from chapter one to the end of 19, and we are in revelation 20, that is all fulfilled from one to the end of 19 in the first century. And Jesus took the bulk of the wrath of God that you read about in the Bible. And it's prophesied way back in Deuteronomy, way back in Leviticus, Ezekiel. And he heaped it upon those who perpetrated the cross and crucified the Lord of glory. The greatest thing that ever happened was when Lord God was manifest in the flesh and Jesus Christ came to save our souls. But on the other side of that work was those who perpetrated the cross and those who killed him. And, and even in Acts chapter 2, Peter said, You have taken by wicked hands according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So it was going to happen. But just think of it. The bulk of the wrath of God comes under the canopy of the immediate years following the cross, extending to one complete generation of 40 years. And that people received that. It, it, it puts your focus on the cross, just like the entire New Testament does. Should prophecy be any different? We all agree the cross, the death, bear, and the resurrection was the greatest thing happened to the human race. But here, even prophecy is under the canopy of the cross, where futurism throws it 2,000 years into the future, all the judgment that is associated with the wrath of God. And, and historicism puts it all through the centuries. But this view and this view only puts it under those immediate years onto that generation that crucified the Lord. And you know, the punishment fits the crime. And the crime of the cross would be the greatest crime there could be. That means there would be judgment and wrath and tribulation worse than any before or any since because the punishment fits the crime. And you know, we Gentiles that are in the church and even saved Jews that are in the church, we need to fear because they walked away from God and they served two masters. They tried to play with the enemy, straddling the fence between hell and heaven and claim to serve God and we're actually living for the devil. And Christians can do the same thing. And that's exactly why Romans 11 says, we need to fear because if they were broken off because of their unbelief, what's going to happen to us who don't even naturally belong to this tree? But aren't you glad we're all in the olive tree now? Hallelujah. Folks, Jesus Christ came and his own bride, Jerusalem and Israel, crucified him, committed adultery with a man who claimed to be God, Nero Caesar, and all the other Caesars, and killed 
her own bridegroom, Jesus Christ, on the cross and said, let his blood be on us and on our children. And all through Revelation, every now and then you'll see a note. They repented not. They repented not. Why? Because they were given a chance to repent 40 years span of time. And the ones that didn't get saved, and many did, many got saved during those years before 70 AD. The ones that didn't get saved were destroyed, but not a hair of any Christian's head perished because they had heeded Jesus' words to flee to the hills when they see Jerusalem surrounded with armies.